Hello, everyone. This is Rick with the Cyber Pro Podcast. And it's really to share their insights. Five questions in about nine minutes because Packers never sleep. We are bringing back a repeat offender, Mr. Joe McManus. He was episode number 51 in April of 2021, where he talked a lot about being proactive and he talked about the design phase to mitigate extra cyber threat. We're moving forward on a whole bunch of cool new questions and we're excited to have Joe back. Joe, let's kick it off. What have you been up to since last being on the Cyber Pro Podcast? Well, you know, a bunch of really cool things. So um, still at Drizzy, where we've just pushed forward our cybersecurity posture, which has just been a fantastic journey. Um, we're now an Uber company. And since then, you know, my side gig, because I just love talking about security, is I helped kick off the undergrad cyber program at Utah State University, where I'm an adjunct professor. No big deal there. I've heard some good things. That will be one of the bonus questions we talk about, so don't give too much away. Uh, and, and folks that are listening, make sure you go find that bonus part that. Next question for you. How do you feel cybersecurity in the landscape has evolved over the past few years? You know, I think it, the stakes are higher than ever before, right? Um, you know, a long time ago, it didn't matter if you were hacked. It kind of went in the news. It went away. Not a big deal, right? Um, the FCC did put out a great article showing how um, over time, uh, hacked company stock underperformed the rest of the market, but it still went up, right? So, hey, whatever. But now the FTC, uh, I believe it was the FTC who was looking into um, looking into the uh, uh, SolarWinds uh, uh, hack, right? Like there are major uh, things at stake now, not only from the business side of it, but from you as, as a CISO, right? So you really just have to, everybody has to up their game. And I think that's one of the things that changed the most. Like you have to just have, you know, really good things around privacy and security and detailed controls and a detailed security um, project and plan and program. So things have changed there. You know, the threats are still more or less the same. You know, it's that OWASP top 10 hasn't changed much. Um, but, you know, that's the biggest thing that's changed is sort of the stakes. I love it. And so talking about the stakes, let's talk a little bit about future thinking. Are there any emerging trends or technologies or even approaches that you are excited about? You know, I think we're finally at the point where AI and ML are actually not snake oil, right? I have purchased so many things as you know, part of the sales pitches. You know, our AI will learn your... I just never noticed that, right? Um, but but I think we're finally at the point where like, like statistics, which is what AI is, right? Like that is working out for us. I mean, we're still... I, I haven't seen an effective tool that can say that, you know, Rick logged in every day between eight and five. Rick logged in at two in the morning. So now alerts being generated. But wait, Rick logged in from the same IP he always logged in from with the same fingerprint of the host OS using a VPN. So it's probably not a severity one alert, maybe a severity two alert. Like, I think we're getting to the point where things like that actually work. Um, if it doesn't, Rick, you and I will we'll patent that, and that'll be our new our new product. <laughs> but that's Love something it. that we're super excited about. You've heard it here. It's already in the patent office right now, so that's what we're working on. That's great. I love it. So I'd love to hear a real-world cybersecurity story from you that we can take some takeaways and lessons and just learn from it. That's an interesting one. Um, you know, I have, to, <laughs> I have to think about what I can talk about publicly. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> I spent a long time as a researcher at CERT at Carnegie Mellon, and I worked on some really awesome, exciting cases. And those are some of the most fun things to talk about, but I don't always get to freely speak about those. So I might speak about uh, an abstract, which I think um, is super important right now if we could talk about insider threat, right? Um, so insider threat is one of the things we always overlook, right? Especially, you know, companies like, well, you're, you know, you're inside the firewall, you're on our network, you have an account, you should be trusted. Um, but we know that one in four cyber attacks is from someone inside the company. And because they're inside the company, they're, um, the, the impact of the, of the cyber incident is 50% greater than external threat actors. I'm not making those numbers up. That is a report from the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. It's updated, uh, I believe, every year. Fantastic report if you haven't viewed it. But um, what are the things that go out, like, once again, it's insider threat. So it's either self-inflicted wounds or a threat actor. Um, there's a great article in Wired about the 2017 insider threat at iRobot. Um, so I only know about this, what was in the article. So this is a fascinating story. 
where essentially an intern uh, stole the plans for iRobot's next gen robot. Now, um, they got fired because they were unsure like what was happening exactly. It was connecting to more systems than he should have. Next, you know, iRobot and this person show up at a, at a DARPA or a DOD event with robots. Person suddenly has an amazingly complex robot, wins a DOD bid for $300 million. Um, iRobot took it to court because they showed that they, it was their IP that was stolen. It was their product. But that was a huge, like, yeah, it's great that they won. But think of the time spent on that incident. And I think that's something that really feeds into another thing I'm super passionate about when it comes to security, which is situational awareness. So how do you build up that situational awareness inside your company to fight things like insider threat? You can also think about account takeover attacks, which are really on the rise. In 2022 and 2023, we've seen account takeover attacks just, just skyrocket. Um, so this is where situational awareness helps. So think of an account takeover attack, which is tying into insider threat. Um, you have um, sort of credential stuffing, or we, we, we rename things all the time in security. So, so maybe it's not called <laughs> credential stuffing right now. Maybe it's called password reuse. But look at the style of, of ATO attack. If you have an authenticated user logging in with a password, well, that's not going to generate an alert, is it? Because that's a user with the correct username and password. And if you look at things like, um, I have a, I run a honeypot. And I was looking at an attack in one of my honeypots. And um, there were... <laughs> 40,000 login attempts. Of those 40,000 login attempts in one ATO, um, over 39,000 had appeared in previous breaches. So I, um, I, you could, if you haven't uh, checked out Have I Been Phoned, you can pay a dollar a month for their API key. So I, um, I paid for that API key in mm -hmm. query. The average number of attacks, um, the average number of breaches those accounts appeared in was 11. The maximum was over 300. So that was really interesting. So that there was an incredibly high success rate for first login to password because these these people are using the same passwords everywhere, right? This is a sample data set I've gotten off the internet for my honeypot. And so it was successful based on that. So your situation awareness would we'll alert for, do we have a spike in login attempts? Do we have a spike in weird things happening from authorized users? So for your insider threat, or your account takeover, a lot of the same technology can work. So think of building alerts off regular behavior. So don't just alert on failed actions, alert on increases of allowed actions, right? A user is allowed to download a file, which should they be allowed, allowed to download 100 files? A user, you know, we have users who log in, but should you have, you know, uh, you know a three standard deviation increase in logins in, in five minutes, right? So look into things like that and an alert on that. So that can help for your insider threat, that can help for your account takeover. And then if we're talking about town takeover as security people, we just have to mention multi-factor off. Just just enable it everywhere you go. And and you know, just because you said it earlier in that in that conversation part, uh, you're not wrong about us changing the names of things in cybersecurity, but I also find it amusing that we start to redefine and use multiple definitions, like the word response means fifteen different things to fifteen different cybersecurity people. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and it and the, the skill set has changed with the way we change these acronyms. You know, um, I was recently talking to someone about doing some forensic analysis of a laptop. And before, I didn't know a security person who didn't want to dig into forensics, didn't want to acquire a disk image, hold up an NCase, look at it. And now it's, well, we farm that out to someone. <laughs> and so that was really interesting to me. You, know, like, you don't have that in-house? In oh, that, that's crazy. I mean, you've got a write blocker in that drawer over there. I, I would jump at the chance to analyze a disk. I don't need to anymore because I'm an executive, but you know, it's still super fun. You choose not to. That's the difference. That's the difference. <laughs> I thought, now I make my students do it now. So that way I have an excuse to create a, a disk image and I get to analyze. Nice. Joe, fun and final question. We previously asked you your favorite retro technology, but now what's your favorite current piece of technology that makes you smile? You know, I have, I'll unplug it and show everybody. I just have to restart my tasks later. I have a um, four Jetson Nanos inside the Seed Studio case. And so the Jetson Nano, you know, it's a low cost AI enabled device. Um, I mean, I think like a used laptop probably has more actual horsepower, but it's fun to have four discrete machines that you can build into uh, a LexD cluster. You can build it into, uh, I've, I've had micro on here. I've had K3S. Um, 
Uh, I use it for a bunch of different things. Um, one of them is my IRC bot that runs on it, right? Like there's just a bunch of fun things you can do with this. I also have, I think the Nano is one of the coolest new pieces of technology. I have a uh, a Sparkmon uh, Jetson AI robot and I have it sometimes drive around, you know, I tinker with it and have it drive around and look at, uh, I'll try to do some object identification in the house. And it's just like this technology, the fact that I can buy this crazy four gig embedded device for $99, I think they have a two gig version for $59, is just mind blowing. I mean, it totally democratizes like the kind of technology that you can you can make a plaything, and that's really cool. I mean, I'm gonna date myself here, but I remember buying a Sun 280R blade server. That was like, I probably spent like $40,000 on it and it had four gigs of RAM, right? Like this is just <laughs> crazy, this, this technology is so, is so cheap and fun to play with. That's what I'm super stoked on right now. You can. Do a lot of really fun Python with it. It comes with a bunch of Docker containers so you can do your own machine learning uh, uh, training. And they have a free course you can go through and get like machine learning certified. So it's it's pretty neat tech. And I'm, I think people should really dig into that and, and and play with it because as much as there is like the hype train is on AI right now, like last year, like nobody talks about NFTs anymore. Um, now it's all AI. But I think like for actual practical things and not snake oil, like it's, it's pretty neat. Like one project I did with it is I, I'm a, I'm a shutterbug. I, I like to take pictures. Um, I had to run through all of my photos and create tags. So I could search by dog or bike or something like that and pull up all the photos um, with that. And I thought that was pretty fun. Amazing. Joe, thank you so much for being on the Cyber Pro Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for watching the Cyber Pro Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on new podcasts and bonus content.